Our scripture for this morning comes to us through the letter to the Hebrews, the sixth chapter, beginning with the ninth verse. Hear these words. Even though we speak in this way, beloved, we are confident of better things in your case, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust. He will not overlook your work and the love that you showed for his sake in serving the saints as you still do. And we want each one of you to show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope to the very end so that you may not become sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. This reveals to us the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Is that working? All right. So with the theme, with the theme of fall and looking forward to fall, one of my favorite parts of fall is waiting for that first cup of pumpkin latte, hot pumpkin latte, none of this cold stuff. And it's even better if it has an extra shot of espresso. And so I thought, well, uh, and, and last week, Pastor Kyle shared, if you weren't here last week, about Jesus and parables and how Jesus used everyday objects and, and activities to teach deeper spiritual truths. He would use everyday things in his culture and his time that people would understand and, and be able to gain an understanding of deeper things through his teaching. And so with that in mind... And, and my love for all things latte, uh, I began to look for scriptures that have to do with coffee. And, you know, that, that was an interesting challenge. And then as I began to narrow down those scripture passages, I began to think through possible titles for today's sermon, things like espresso, your faith, or spice it up. Or, uh, you, you know, uh, the one I settled on was a better blend, and, and we'll look at why. And then I decided of the scripture passages I found, I had to choose the one from Hebrews. And, and you know that Hebrews is a follow-up from the Old Testament book of Malachi. But um, anyway, I digress. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at this passage in Hebrews that Pastor Kyle read for us. And in that passage... The uh, letter of Hebrews is a little different than some of the other books in the New Testament, some of the other letters or epistles, in that it's titled uh, not for the name of a city, not for the name of a group of people who live in a particular town like Corinthians or Philippians, uh, but it's titled to an ethnic group, the Hebrews. It's written to a group of Christian believers, and the writer writes as their pastor uh, a sort of like sermon in letter form. He writes to encourage, to instruct, but also to warn. And so we're going to look at that, and in, in verses 11 and 12, he tells them, and we want each one of you to show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope to the very end so that you not become sluggish. So what can we do as Christians to not become sluggish in our faith? And will a cup of coffee fill the bill? Will you pray with me as I pray for us? Gracious God, we thank you for your word that is the living word. May you speak words of life to us and awaken our souls this day. Fill this room and every room from which we gather with the presence of your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and speak through me this day. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
chapter 1 of Letters to the Hebrews. Today's passage is from chapter 6. Chapter 1 opens with a reference about how God spoke in Old Testament times as God spoke through the prophets to instruct God's people. But now God has spoken through Jesus Christ. There's talk about angels and how Jesus is greater than the angels and that all the angels are to worship Jesus. In verse 8 of chapter 1, we're told that his throne is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is a scepter of your kingdom. In chapter 2, verse 1, the writer tells us, therefore, we must pay greater attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. Chapter 4 starts out with this word of caution. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest is still open, let us take care that none of you should seem to have failed to reach it. We read in the first few verses of chapter 6 where we find today's scripture before we come to that passage that the readers along with the writer were second generation Christians. And by that, I mean, we're told that they've, these Christians have already been baptized. They've been fully instructed in the faith. In fact, we read in the previous chapter in five, verse 12, that they've been believers long enough that many of them are teachers. But their faith has become stunted and in, in, in their spiritual growth has slowed down. Some members no longer even attended their assemblies. And uh, of course, this was not due to a pandemic. <laughs> it was due to spiritual malaise. We read in Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25, and let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Hebrews 4.14 provides another description of their condition. Let us hold fast to our confession. That is, let us not, let, us not let go of our belief and our hope and our faith that Jesus is the Son of God and, and that Jesus died for you and me and that salvation is through Jesus Christ. Let us hold fast to our confession of the faith because it can slip away and we can drift away. And that's where coffee enters in. When the writer of Hebrews uh, expresses concern that these Christians not become sluggish. Now, if you're a coffee drinker, you know how sluggish a morning can begin until you smell the coffee and, and take a taste of that first cup. You understand how energetic one might feel before they have that first cup of java. And I'm not an expert on caffeine, but I did consult Professor Google. And we know that caffeine acts as a central nervous system stimulant. It increases alertness. Many people drink coffee because it helps them to feel more awake and less tired. Coffee, or the caffeine is a common ingredient in coffee. And it's also a common ingredient in medications to treat or manage drowsiness, headaches, and even migraines. Coffee, quote, makes us more alert, less bored, and provides a good mood boost, unquote. It makes us feel energetic. We even see coffee in Facebook memes and inscribed onto coffee mugs themselves with sayings such as, I start working when my coffee does. But first, coffee, or coffee and then the world, or fueled by caffeine, or rising grind, or better latte than never. Let's just say that sluggish isn't a good way to go through life, and it's not a good way to go through our spiritual lives. It's not a good thing to allow to creep into our souls. The writer of Hebrews has been telling the Christians about the danger of becoming content with the basic introductory teachings of the Christian faith. And in verse 9, the writer shifts course and he expresses confidence and hope in these, these loved ones that he is writing to. He calls them beloved for the only time in this sermon. He writes, even though we speak in this way, beloved, 
We are confident of better things in your case, things that belong to salvation. And although some among this group of Christians seem to be at risk for, for drifting away from God, it's evident that God has been doing things through their lives and that God is still at work through what they are doing and through their lives of service and sharing God's love. God's investment in them is producing fruit. They, they are showing God's love in, in the passage we read towards the saints, towards fellow believers. And not only do they have that past record of serving that gives the preacher who's writing this letter confidence, but he sees and God sees, he assures them that God sees that they continue to do acts of service towards one another. It's interesting that the word that this preacher uses for serving in the original Greek refers to many kinds of ministries. It's the same Greek word that was used in Matthew 20, 28, after the mother of James and John came to Jesus with her sons and knelt at Jesus' feet and begged him to let one son sit on his left and one sit on his right. The other ten disciples were angry with the two brothers, and Jesus uses that same Greek word that's used in Hebrews 6.10 when he tells them, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave or your servant. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This is the kind of service the writer of Hebrews is talking about. We might say that verse 11 zooms in to the personal level as now the writer addresses each individual reader of his letter. And he writes these words, we want each one of you to show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope to the very end. Every single one of you, it's going to take you all. Everyone in this faith community are to, to be intentional about being diligent, being persistent, so that they might realize the fullness of hope to the very end offered to every believer in Christ. And as we place our hope in God, we might say that Jesus Christ is the grounds of our hope. And we will be empowered, we'll be energized, we'll be made alert to throw off the sluggishness, to throw off that dullness that tends to overtake us. And this is what the preacher to Hebrews wants for them. He uses the word wants in verse 11. He said, and we want each one of you, each one to show the same diligence. This word for want isn't just, oh, you know, it'd be nice if it happens. It's a strong word that means to, I passionately want more than anything in the world. If I could have one thing, this is what I desire from you. Those reading or hearing these words would have understood and appreciated that this is their pastor's passionate desire that they mature in Christ. Their preacher wants them and us today to understand that the very end has not yet come. When a person says yes to God's invitation to receive God's grace and God's love, when we become baptized as a disciple of Jesus Christ, it's not a situation where we've received our ticket to enter into heaven and, and we can sit down and say, I'm done. I've made it, I've attained. It's just the beginning point. And then there's more growth in grace and more service in God's love and more growth in, in grace and growing deeper in our love for Christ and, and growing uh, more intentional in our service and our passion to show God's love to those around us. This section ends with the encouragement to be imitators. <laughs> it can be a scary thing to be imitated, can't it? parents and grandparents. They're encouraged to be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises of God. Hebrews goes on to give examples of those who lived with great faith and faithfulness to God, going all the way back to Abraham. We're called to worship together, to encourage one another, to serve together, and to serve alongside one another. It's those who have gone before us and who have modeled faith and patience through difficult and dark times that can help us remain diligent 
in our faith when difficult times come. And I wonder, who do you know who has been that person of faith and of patience that you can model your faith journey and your discipleship after? And who's looking at you and sees you as the one that they can imitate to grow in their faith and in their faithfulness? Those who are faithful to the very end, the writer says, will inherit the promises of God. Joy will come with the dawn. And as we find ourselves in the season of fall, we know that too quickly winter is coming. As it's a prime season for coffees of every time, from lattes to espressos to spiced coffees, in winter we enter into a time of sluggishness when the daylight hours are few, when, when morning is darker, longer into the day, and when nightfall comes too quickly. Psychiatrists have labeled a disorder that they call SAD. Interesting that it spells SAD as an acronym. It means seasonal affective disorder. Psychology today states that four to six percent of people may have winter depression. Another 10 to 20 percent may have a mild case of what they call SAD, seasonal affective disorder. And combined, that means almost one out of every four of us. SAD is four times more common in women than in men. There are also what we might call cool seasons or, or, or dark times of the soul. Those are times when the light of God seems far away from us, times where we feel lethargic and when we don't feel like doing anything, even in service to others. There are times when we thirst, when we thirst for God, and we sang about that this morning in, in that chorus, as the deer pants for the water. Those words come from Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2, where the psalmist prays these words, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? The psalmist knew that his hope was in God. On a dark, cool morning, a fresh cup of coffee can bring warmth to one's body and alertness to one's mind. But that's nothing compared to the joy that comes when we enter into relationship with God, when we place our hope in God through Jesus Christ. The psalmist encourages us with these words in chapter 30, verse 5. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. And in Psalms 57, 8. Awake, my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. Other times, perhaps we become sluggish because we lose track of what we should be doing. Today's scripture encourages us to be diligent in serving, and I came across a sermon illustration that, that I'm going to close with. It's a sort of modern-day metaphor or parable, you might say, about serving one another. So I had to go by a coffee shop to get, an, uh, to get a, an example here for you today, you know, had to have a real live example of a coffee cup. And I want you to imagine yourself as this cup for a minute. This cup represents many ways that God can use you. And we long to be filled up to the top. We long to be filled up with God's grace and love. And other times, we may long to be filled up with opportunities, opportunities to scatter those seeds that Chris talked about in the children's moments, to share God's love with those around us. And we can pray, God, would you just fill me up with opportunity or, or, or the ability to influence, to make a difference for your kingdom. Give me a platform or, or the opportunity to speak on your behalf or maybe to be an example someone can imitate. And we offer ourselves to spice up and to warm up and to awaken others to God's love and grace. The problem is, 
sometimes we think of ourselves as a coffee instead of the cup. We think we are the ones that can benefit everyone and that are most beneficial to God's kingdom. And maybe we even think that we deserve a seat at Jesus' right or left side because of how much we think we have to offer. There's a woman named Isabella. She works in a downtown city and, and she cleans offices and condos and luxury penthouses. Her job doesn't give her an out and, out and in front of everybody kind of platform like maybe a college professor might have or a CEO or, or a church committee person or, or even a, you know, a teacher teaching a classroom of people virtually or in person. But her service is no less valuable. And, and I think about our call to serve when I think of her and our, our call to serve others and to serve God and and you see this sleeve that's on the cup. It's only got one job. It's to support the cup. That's it. And I think sometimes God says to us, that's what I want you to do today. I want you to support someone else's cup. And I think sometimes God says, I don't want you to be the cup today. I, I want you, I need you to be the sleeve. Take the heat for someone else. Protect someone else from difficult circumstances. And it can be a humbling role to be a sleeve when you think your best role is to be the cup. We may not be the person leading the committee, teaching the class, or being a key leader, but when we serve as a sleeve, our role is crucial if others are to enjoy the coffee, the fulfillment, the purpose, and the joy of God's grace and God's love in their lives. And there are times when perhaps our role is not the sleeve, or is not the sleeve and is not the cup. Some days we're called to be the napkin. Napkins clean up messes. You ever feel like all you do is clean up other people's mess? Oh, but we need those napkins. And napkins not only wipe coffee off of the corners of our mouths, napkins can be used to dry tears. When we're a napkin, sometimes we bring hope and healing just by being a listening ear to someone else who's in crisis or going through a dark time of the soul. The cup, the sleeve, and the napkin, the roles aren't mutually exclusive. Maybe today God will give you an opportunity to step up and lead even if you're not used to it. Maybe God will use you as a cup in someone else's life, and, and maybe tomorrow God will ask you to step down and be the sleeve that supports somebody else as they lead. And the day after that, God may ask you to serve as a napkin, to just be there for someone, and to help make the invisible kingdom of God more visible. And as we serve God and others, God will fill us with the joy of the Lord. To bring the kingdom of God is, is to bring what's up there down here. And maybe the way to do that is to worry less about where we're to step up and to pray more about where we can step down and serve. Whatever role God gives you, the cup, the sleeve, or the napkin, don't ever forget you're not the coffee. And keep in mind, someone may look, be looking at you as someone to imitate, as someone who's a model of what it is to be filled with God's hope and God's love and to share that with others. Espressos, pumpkin spice lattes, mochas, these things might wake us up. They may energize you for an hour or two, but God at work through Jesus Christ to fill you up with God's love to offer God's hope and God's love to others. Now that's a better blend. In the name of Jesus the Christ, amen.